Take your Bible, turn, I have this up on the screen. Uh, we are learning about God, who God is, what God is. So i tell you what I want. I want to ask some of the young people here. Uh, Michaela, I'm going to ask you a question, okay, about God. What do you think God looks like? The sun? Wow! Wow! Say it backwards. Wow! That's great because that's what the Bible says. He's the sun of righteousness. And you know, you can't look at the sun. You can't stare at it. It'll burn your eyes out. Well, God is like that. God is so glorious that our eyes cannot behold Him right now. So, your daughter's a genius. Okay? So, whatever genius gene that I had got passed right down to her. Okay. Um, Tirza, let me ask you a question. What kind of chair does God sit in? Is it like a stool or is it like a reclining chair or like a lo a throne? These guys are smart. That's, that's right on. God sits on a throne. Hey Amen. High five that girl. That's that genius gene that's in there, in there somewhere. Okay. Pretty good guys. Um, okay, I'm, you're hiding, and I, and I can't think of your name right now, but I'm going to ask you a question, okay? How old is God? Say it loud. He's older than the earth? Of course he is. Do you know how old he is? He isn't. He's forever. Okay? I don't think you can say about God what his age is because he is ageless. Okay? That sounds like a makeup for women. Ageless. Okay? So, great answers, guys. Great answers. I, I, what I like is to hear the young people say things that just floor you. When they say things about God, okay? Uh, when Michaela was little, she used to say, Mommy, I want to live in Jesus' house. I don't want to live in Manson's house. Apparently, Manson is Satan. So I don't know if she was referring to Charles Manson or Marilyn Manson, but either way, they're both Satan. But she said, I don't want to live in Manson's house. I want to live in Jesus' house. So amen to that. All right, John chapter 1, uh, we're learning, we, we were talking last week. Uh, does, who has their notes from last week? All right, great job. I've added to it. So I was going to print some more out, but I'll wait a couple weeks and then give you the updated version. Uh, but we were talking about who God is, and He is the Creator. And I don't think I, I got to the part where we were talking about... Um, why God created everything that is. Why did He do it? Because that's the question that practically everybody at one point in their life will ask is, what is my purpose? And you know, if you think about it, the fish, the cows, the dogs, the snakes, the dinosaurs, the birds, none of those creatures have the ability to think themselves and think the question, why am I here? They do not have that soul in them, that living soul, that consciousness. They don't have that. So no dog ever thought in his mind, I wonder what I'm here for. What is my purpose in life? They just don't think that way. All right. But humans do. And I believe the Bible. I believe that God has put some basic knowledge in every human being of who he is. And what he is, and God said in Romans 1 that we can see it in the creation. We were talking about that 
Sunday night when we're going through the book of Genesis. And so the interesting thing is the Bible actually tells you and identifies the very purpose of why we're here. So let's start there in John 1. We'll read this verse and we'll go to Revelation. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Bible is the Word of God. And if you go back to Genesis 1 and look at the creation, you see that God created everything by saying it. God And God said, let there be light. And God said, let us make man. And God said... So we know that the heavens and the earth and everything that is, that God created it by speaking the words. He created it out of nothing because there was nothing. And so God created everything that is out of nothing by speaking it. So in verse 2, it says the same, meaning the word, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And, of course, we covered last week the idea that God even created bad things. God created darkness. God created evil. God created death. God created hell. So everything that is, good, bad, ugly, God made it. And if it exists, it exists because God created it. And if it doesn't exist, it's because God didn't create it. It's that simple. So we're not this universe. And I, I may spend a little time going through the complexity of a one-celled life form. A life that exists on this earth that is only one tiny microscopic cell and show you how complex that one cell is and it's, it is absolutely ridiculous to think that all of the parts of the first living cell on the earth was made by itself. I don't believe it. There's never been a record ever of something writing its own DNA. It's never happened. So I don't believe it. I don't, I don't care how much time they give the universe to do this thing. And even the guy, Francis Crick, who helped form the idea of what DNA looks like and how it's built and how it's made, he even said it shows an intelligent, intentional design to it. But of course, he believes that aliens in some form planted us here. There's actually a scientific idea called panspermia that says that something that our life on this earth actually came from outer space and it fell here and found a place where it to grow. So the question then is, where did that life come from? I mean, you've got to chase it down to somewhere where it was made. And so to me, it's just easier to believe that God said it and it's there. Okay. The complexity of life shows that it takes intention and design. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. So now turn to um, uh, Revelation 4. The last book of the Bible tells you why. Why you're here. Why God made you. Why God created you, why God brought you into this earth. Revelation 4, and we hear it from the angels. Revelation 4, this is John, he's, he's taken up to see God's tabernacle in heaven. And he sees this, the candlestick, the seven candlesticks, the seven spirits of God. He sees the 24 elders, he sees the throne, and, and one sitting on the throne. And it says in verse 10, the four and 20 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. And worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You, please, God, 
just by your existence. Who's ever built something? Sterling, you built your house. Okay? So it, it can be said that the house that he built is, is his creation. It's his, he designed it. He framed it. He built it. And he's good at that. And he built it the way he wanted it. And his wife. And, they, and how long have you lived in that house? 40, 42 years? 1980? About 1980 is when you built it, right? 1980? 76? Wow. Okay, so that's been what? Oh, yeah, 40, 43 years. They haven't moved. They don't want to. Because they built the house that they wanted and they get pleasure from and comfort from where they live. That's their creation. That's what they did. They get joy out of that. Um, I like to sit down sometimes when I'm alone and I play my keyboard and I'll just come up with little songs. They're not really much of anything, but it's just me playing and I'm playing what I like to hear. And it gives me pleasure. It kind of helps me with my mood sometimes. If I'm down, I'll sit at the piano and take everything out on that poor piano. But I'm playing what I'm creating and I like it and it's giving me pleasure. And somehow, some way, everybody in life does something for themselves that brings themselves pleasure. And so God put that in us because it came from God and God created everything that is for his pleasure. Now, God's a big God and he's got a big brain and he's way beyond our understanding. But that part of it, I understand. God created you for his pleasure. So, you want to know the purpose in life? Please God. Please God. Do you know how? Do you know how? Turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. This is how you please God. And when I, when I tell you what I'm going to tell you about this, hopefully it'll make sense to you. Hebrews 11. We have the man Enoch, who was our example in the Bible. In Genesis 5, Enoch, the Bible says, walked with God and was not, for God took him. So what happened was, Enoch lived his life for God, and one of these days, or one day, God, I don't know how he did it, maybe sent angels, I don't know, but basically picked Enoch up from the world that he lived in, this world, and transported him into heaven. He did, Enoch didn't die. He did not die. He was taken from earth to heaven. And now how did that happen? By faith, Hebrews eleven five, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch pleased God. But how did Enoch please God? And I asked a room full of preachers this one time. I said, how, did, how do we please God? And several of them said, we obey him. But look at verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So how do you please God? You believe what he said. You believe what he said. So I'll just give you this. I'm not going to get into this tonight, but I'll, I'll give you this. I had people, because here lately I've been talking about some weird things going on in the world. People are seeing things. They don't know how to, they don't know what it is. But I said to them, tell me your testimony. Tell me, tell me what it is that you saw. And I had a lady sit down with me and tell me that, uh, something that happened to her when she was about 12, 13 years old. She never forgot it to this day. She's never forgot the details of what happened. But she said, I told my mom and dad, and they yelled at me and said that I was making that up, told me to, Keep quiet about that. And she said, I've never told another living soul 
until I just told you tonight. She let me record it. And I said, I believe you. She said, thank you. Thank you. She wanted to tell her story, but she was afraid people wouldn't believe her. They'd make fun of her. And when I sat down with her, I mean, this is a godly woman. She told me the story, and I said, I believe you. And that brought her great joy and relief. Now that she's told her story, and somebody actually believed what she said, I think she's free now from that. Isn't it, isn't it something that when you've got something to say to somebody, and you're afraid they're going to, how they're going to react, but then they say to you, you know what, thank you for telling me that. I believe you. Doesn't that give you joy? Doesn't that bless you? Or when you tell your heart to somebody and somebody says, you're lying. I don't believe that. That's nonsense. You're just like, okay. And you never open your mouth again the rest of your life. Okay. And I'm telling you, God, what pleases God, this new covenant that we live under is about believing what God said. You want to please God? Read the Bible and believe it. Read the Bible and believe that God created us and he gets pleasure from his creation. So Revelation 10, here's a mighty angel and he's swearing because he can swear to no higher. He's swearing by him, meaning God that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. So when God created the world, He created time. But there's coming a time when God stops time. Time is done. Time is up. And I've done my work. And now we're going to enjoy the fruits of it for all of eternity. But here you have the mighty angel, which I believe is Jesus, but he swears by God who liveth forever, who created heaven, all the things that are in heaven, the earth and all the things that are in the earth and the sea and all the things that are in the sea. God created every one of them for his pleasure. Who has a fishbowl, a fish tank, an aquarium? Who has one? Anybody have a fish tank? Is that like, we don't do that no more? You had one, right? You had a fish? Why did you have a fish? Tell me why you had a fish. That's not the story I wanted. Who had a fish? That they like to go and look at the fish in the tank. That's what I was getting at. Pleasure. You're looking at, even though you didn't make it, you're looking at all your little fishies and you're tapping on the glass and you like, it's, it's beautiful. That's why we do that. All right, now back to Genesis 6. Because here's the thing. If God created us, and if God created this earth, God created the stars, the sun, the moon, He created everything in the ocean, everything on the land, everything in the air, every speck of dust, every creature, every life form, God created it, everything, that means He owns it. He has property rights to it. By the way, God blesses man with property ownership who believes in that say amen you know how i know that because god put a law that said thou shalt not steal you know what that says it says that you as a human have a right to own something and we're living in a world right now where socialism and communism is creeping in even to our country that despises personal ownership of property because it says that actually this should belong to everybody. Everybody should have, everybody should have the fruit of your labor. Everybody should be able to enjoy the land that you have. Everybody should be able to enjoy the things that you've worked for. That really shouldn't belong to you. That should belong to everybody. And that's communism, but that's not what God said. God said, thou shalt not steal. And by saying that, he said, you have a right. If you own it, you have a right to it. And nobody else does including the government so genesis 6 verse 7 the lord said i will destroy man whom i have created from the face of the earth no, notice what he said i will destroy man whom i have created 
God created man. God gave man laws. Man broke God's laws and despised God. And God has the right to destroy his creation. He has the right to. Uh, if you wrote a song, got it copyrighted. You have rights to that song. You have rights to say, nobody else in the world can sing this song except me. You have a right to that. And if you don't want anybody to sing it, you can lock it up somewhere and take it away and say, nobody, nobody gets to sing this song. This is my song and you can't have it. You have rights to it. And God created man and God said, I don't like how man's turning out. And God had the right. God's not a murderer. God is not unjust. God's not evil like we are. He doesn't think the way we think. God has the right. So he said, I'll destroy man from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God also, when he had the right to, to, to destroy his creation, he also had the right to have mercy on his creation. God said, I will have mercy on who I want to have mercy. And I will, have, I will give pardon to who I give pardon to. It is God's choice alone because he's the creator. Revelation 20. Here it is. Look at here. Revelation 20. There's a judgment. Now this, now we're going to phase into God is the creator. Now God is the judge. God is the judge. People say, I don't, you're judging me. I don't want you judging me. Only God can judge me. Okay. I agree with that. God created you. God gave you the laws to live by. And you had a choice to either live by them or not live by them. You made your choice. But now you have to stand before your creator and give an account of your life. And nobody, nobody bargains with God, the creator. Nobody does. You're either guilty or you're not guilty. And if you're guilty, you have an option. You can have your sins taken away from you by Jesus Christ. That's another thing about God. He loves you at, he loves you so much that he was willing to submit his righteous son as a sacrifice for you in your place. So I don't like talk that non-believers say about our God that he's a murderer because God sent Joshua in to kill all those poor innocent people. Uh, God said they weren't innocent. God created them. God had a right. God does not think the way we think. God is not unjust in what he does. He is righteous in every decision that he makes. And he has a right to do that. So Revelation 20 verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their what? Their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. I mean, think about that. When If you die at sea, if you're in the Navy or something like that, and you're in battle and you die at sea, where do they bury you? They dump you in the ocean. Okay? Don't worry about if the sharks eat you or not. God knows how to resurrect. Hey, if God made you out of nothing, then God knows how to resurrect you out of nothing. That's what he's been doing. So the sea gave up the dead, um, which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this, but I've explained this before, that if you think that your good deeds are going to outweigh your bad deeds, you're mistaken. Because God said in Ezekiel 33, that in the day that a righteous man transgresses, all of his righteousness are gone. So you can have a pile up of good deeds stacked to the ceiling. One, one unrighteous deed and God takes away all your righteousness. You'll never, you'll never get that balanced. You never will. That's, that's how God does it. God is the judge and he has a right to judge mankind. Let me go through these verses. Psalm 7, you can look on your sheet. Uh, you can follow with me on the screen. You can follow me with you in the Bible. The Psalm 7, the Lord shall judge the people. 
Watch this now. Here's, a, here's an honest man. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. That is a godly man right there. If you can bring yourself to the place to where you can honestly say, God, you judge me. And God, if, if my integrity, if my heart is impure, if I'm doing things for the wrong reason, if my motivations are wrong, if my actions are wrong, God, if my heart is wrong, God, I want you to judge me and I want you to correct me. That's a godly man right there. Because that man recognizes that, yes, only God has the right to judge you. And you want God judging you so you can, your life can be better. Who in here where you work, there is a, a review of your job or how you do your had a work review done on them. So you know what I'm talking about. They watch you, they examine you, they look at your record, they look at how you work, what you do, how, how you sh if you show up late a lot or you're on time a lot or early. They examine you and they have the right to say to you, you're doing pretty good here, but you need to step it up over here because you really are failing in this area here. Now, why, why, why go through that? I would say that it benefits you because there's probably more money if you'll do that. Probably a little higher position. Probably a little bit better pay for that. But you want that because you want to do better. Psalm 711. Uh, God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. God doesn't let anything pass by. If you did it, God knows it. Psalm 9. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou saddest in the throne judging right. Psalm 9, 7, but the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. So who said that God's, his tears are right, said that God sits on a throne, right? Good job. Because God on that throne, tears that he looks at your life. God watches you every day. You know that? I'm not trying to scare you. Do what? Okay, well, that's good. But let's say that there was a day that mom told Tirza to do something and she didn't do it. God saw it. God saw it. He sits on the throne and he watches what we do. And I want you to, I want everybody listening to me, you people online, don't you listen to me? Probably everybody listening to me knows something about secret sins. David himself, Nathan the prophet came to him and said, Thou didst it secretly. Meaning, he lusted after another man's wife, committed adultery with her, got her pregnant, Tried to have her husband come in to cover up the pregnancy. When he wouldn't do it, he had him sent out to battle and killed. And David thought he got away with it. And I'm telling you, God watches everything you do. And you may think that because no other man, your mom and dad or the people at work or the people at church, they didn't find out about it that you got away with it. But I'm telling you, God never lets anybody get away with anything. Never. Ja, uh, Psalm 9:16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. God is known to be the righteous judge of mankind. And he has the right to because we are his creation. Genesis eighteen twenty five that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And in this verse here, it's establishing the idea that God does know the difference between who's righteous and who is wicked. And God is never going to be unrighteous in giving the righteous people a 
judgment that they did not deserve. God's never going to do that. I mean, we're hearing stories now because people were put in jail 20, 30 years ago before DNA testing. And when they test the DNA, they found out that that person really didn't do the crime. And it happens. The American judicial system is probably the best in the world, but it's not perfect. And people get sent to jail when they actually didn't do anything wrong. But with God, that never happens. And it never will. Job 34, 12. Yea, surely God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. So think about this. There's two people in church. One man in the church, he has a lot of money. Puts a lot in the offering plate and does good deeds every now and then. But he's an alcoholic. He's cheating on his wife all the time. He's cheating on his taxes. He's skimming off the top at work. I mean, he's a, he's a lie, a cheat, and a thief. But he gives a lot of money to the church. Then you have another man. Doesn't have a lot of money. He stepped out on his wife a couple times and felt terrible for it and he's trying to get right but he doesn't do a whole lot but he comes to God with apology in his heart and repentance in his heart and says God I, I want to be right so which one is God going to choose here God's going to choose the man whose heart wants to be right and just because a guy in the church gives more money than everybody else does that's not God doesn't do that God he does not take that he does not pervert judgment. God does not accept gifts, bribes. What is it that you can offer God that he doesn't already have? By the way, in the thousand year reign of Christ, when Christ returns, he is bringing his saints with him. I believe that's going to be us. And we're going to help Jesus judge this earth for a thousand years. Now, we're going to be in our perfect bodies, which means that you cannot bribe an angel. You can't, hey, angels have walked on streets made of gold. You can't offer him a thousand bucks because he's got way more than that in his mansion. You see what I'm saying? When God brings us back with him to rule, we're going to actually not have the needs and the lusts of this world. So we won't judge unrighteously. We won't look at the faces of men. We won't pervert judgment because this man's a pillar of the community. And if you brought him down, well, the, the whole thing would come down. God didn't care about that. Job 37, uh, 23, touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. He will not afflict. God never judges wrong, ever. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, underline that in your Bible, he is the righteous judge. He never gets it wrong. I'll give you a Bible illustration. We know that Lot lived in Sodom. We know that Lot was vexed with the wicked deeds of the Sodomites. But we also know that God was not going to rain fire and brimstone down upon Sodom as long as Lot was in Sodom. The angels specifically said that. We cannot judge this city until you are safely out. God will not afflict the righteous. 1 Thessalonians 5 is when it talks about when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child and they shall not escape. And that passage ends up by saying, we are children of the day. Therefore, God has not appointed us to wrath. When God pours out his wrath on this earth and judges the men and the women and the children on this earth, he is not going to inflict us with his wrath. We're going to be saved. For, that's the purpose of getting saved to begin with. So we wouldn't die and go to hell. That throws out purgatory. Purgatory is an invented doctrine to hold power over people and to get their money. 
Because it says, oh, you, he was a good man, but he had some sins and he's in purgatory. Now, we could say a mass that's going to cost you about $10,000 if we say this mass. And that will get him at least to the gates of purgatory. He might have to hang out there for another few years, but he'll finally get out. That's what they tell people. And it's wicked God doesn't do that. There's two classes of people. You're either righteous or you're not. And you have the righteousness of God covering up all of your sins. And God saves you and appoints you to eternal joy while God casts the sinners into the lake of fire. Romans 14.10. Watch this. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, I've learned this one, and I still have to, I struggle with it like everybody else does. Sometimes I've got things in my mind against people. I don't like it. I don't like feeling that way, because the devil likes to play with that stuff and make me think things that are not true. But I'm learning over the years that if I've got ought against somebody... That I'm going to let God deal with it. Let God judge it. Because maybe it's me that's wrong. Maybe I'm the one that needs the correction. And I would hate to make the mistake of unrighteously judging somebody. When in fact they didn't do anything wrong. We all, we all are judged every day at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Everybody. Everybody before the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, that places Christ then equal with God. And what we learn when we go through the attributes of God, when it's time to go through the attributes of Christ, what we'll say is, God's the righteous judge. Jesus is too. God's eternal. Jesus is too. God is the creator. So is Jesus. God is all powerful. So is Jesus. In other words, the attributes that belong to God, that God spells out in the Bible about God, is also equally applied to Jesus Christ. In fact, in the prophecy in Isaiah, when it gave the five names of Jesus, it called him Wonderful, Counselor, and it called him the mighty God. And it called Jesus the Son, the everlasting Father. Are you saying they're the same? Yes. But are they different? Yes. Well, I don't understand that. Amen. You're as smart as the rest of us then. If you don't understand it, just believe it. And let God handle it. Amen. God's smart. Anyway. Revelation 20. I've already read that verse, so I'm, I'm going to move on. I saw the great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth. I don't, did I read that verse already? No. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which was the book of life. So I read that part. But the idea of the great white throne judgment. This is at the end of everything in this universe. Everything in this world, in this creation. God's going to have a final judgment and he's going to judge everything and he, then he's going to be done. And no more judgment. Because everybody's been judged and everybody has been rightly placed either in the new heaven and new earth or the eternal lake of fire. So I would say to everybody tonight, God's your creator. Which means God has the right to judge your life. In practically every country in the world, if, if two people bring into the world children, most countries' laws say those children belong physically to the parents of, those, of that child. Does that make sense? And those parents have certain rights over and can make the decisions for those children. Right? That's in every culture, every civilization. That's my children. 
So it means that I can't just, if I see a little brat at Walmart throwing stuff down on the floor, I can't walk over there and beat the living daylights out of that child. I go to jail for that. But if mama wanted to, mama can. Hopefully still in this state, mama can still do that. I remember the story, you did that to Steve one time. He threw a fit in the grocery store and Sterling commenced a beating on him right there in the middle of the store. And Steve threw a fit and laid there on the ground until Sterling said, I'm going to whip you until you stand up. I guess he finally stood up, did he not? Finally did. Huh? Didn't do it no more either. Okay. See, now if somebody else would have done that, Sterling would have been whipping on them. So it's the idea that we're the children of God. God made us in His image. God has rights over us. And God has a right to judge you. And this nonsense that you've come up with, that your good deeds are going to outweigh your bad deeds, don't believe it. You have, you have a case against you. Just like in a court, you cannot use prior good acts to wipe away you breaking the law. Just, if you murdered somebody just because... You were a member of a society that gave millions of dollars to orphanages. That does not count for you. You still murdered somebody and you have to be held accountable for it. And that's how God's going to judge. Amen? So next week, I, I, I like this one. God is above everything. So he, he's the creator. God is the judge. And now we're going to look at God being above everything. He is the most high God. And there is nothing moster high than God. Doesn't. Never. It's not there. Amen?